Amazing God. Now, that's just one title we can think of, but there's probably a thousand titles that could not explain this. We're going to study it today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Henry. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery Quick Study Television, taking you through the Bible. Today, we're in the Book of Psalms. Corey is here. Corey, what did you do? I'm going to be taking a look at olive oil, not only on the pages of the Bible, but also in the ancient Middle East. All right, very good. Olive oil is interesting. And what did you do, Jim? Well, read up on Psalm 91 because we have a fantastic Friday question coming your way. Okay, very good. Ryan, you've got a question coming. What's up, brother? Well, today we continue our discussion regarding the power of gravity in the cosmos. It can explain a whole lot. All right, it can indeed. We'll talk about that and much more. Get your Bible guide. Turn to today's page because this is exciting. As we begin to study the Word of God, let's listen how it speaks to us. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Psalm 91. You know, a great title for Psalm 91. This is a great song. It could be this, The Amazing God. And that would be just, that, that'd just be a, a title just to call it. That we wouldn't even begin to look at the greatness of this song because it speaks of abiding presence in the Almighty God. Presence, it's always there. If ever you wanted to memorize a piece of scripture, and you should, this would be a great place to start. Although Psalm 91 is not given in a formal setting or a formal place is assigned to it, it's perfect for music and prayerful meditation. The Psalm begins with, quote, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. That's Psalm 91, one. What is that secret place? The Psalm ends with this, it says, quote, with long life, the Lord will satisfy him and show him salvation. Psalm 91, 16, 16 verses. And this is all in the Old Testament. Back when I first came to know the power of the loving presence of Jesus Christ in my own life, Psalm 91 caught my attention and has helped a special place in my heart ever since to grow in the Lord. Praise God. Psalm 91 is unique and Psalm 91 is amazing. I've never really heard Psalm 91 put to music, but I'd love to hear somebody do that who's a composer and a writer. 
Now, as we think this through and as we understand this, let's learn about the words. Again, I said, if we were to put a title to it, it would be The Amazing God. Psalm 91, the whole chapter. Now, turn your page to the last day in May because that's the day we're on. And uh, I want you to, uh, if you don't have a Bible guide, I want to tell you, you can write to us or call us at any time and we'd be happy to send you one. And also, may I say that uh, thank you so much for your gifts and uh, your giving. It's just great. And if you want to do that, man, we would appreciate that. Uh, you can uh, give. You can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and give there. And it'll take you to a, a Bible Discovery page or a Bible Discovery Guide page. And uh, you can get the guide online, too. So uh, make sure that you uh, do that. Very, very important. Now, this amazing God and Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would help us to get a hold of this psalm, because this one's a good one. And uh, I pray that you would teach us your way. Show us your path right now on earth with a lot of things going on in the news and everything else. We stop and we listen to you at this point. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 91 reads like this, verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The shadow of the Almighty. Verse 2 continues, I will save the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him, I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings, you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid, not be afraid of the terror by night, terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor of the destruction that lies waste at noonday. That's amazing. Here we see in Psalm 91, God's truth is our shield and our buckler. God's truth is our shield and our buckler. The truth of the Lord is real. And the truth protects and comforts our soul. We need to understand that. A lot of people don't. A lot of people think, well, your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. Let's just all have a bunch of truth. That doesn't work. Now, we can prove it to you over the next, you know, 20 minutes here with apologetics technology, but we're not going to do that. We're going to explain that if you believe in Jesus Christ and if you know and understand that, then don't let people destroy the truth that God has placed in you. Or try to destroy the truth because it will not be pleasant. But just remember, his truth protects you. I, I tell you, I mean, just this week, God shows us, I mean, there was a time, and I can't tell you the details, but there was a time when I thought that was it, I was, it was over, and God just provided. His truth is that he will take care of those who have need for him. And, and he did. He's done that so many times in my life. God guides us. God helps us. Praise God. Hallelujah. He's the Lord. He is. Psalm 91, 7 says, A thousand may fall at your side. In fact, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Only with your eye you will see and look and, and see the reward of the wicked. We are protected by God's shield. Christians are protected by God's shield. People who believe in Jesus Christ are protected by God's shield. Nothing happens to us unless God says so. Now, if God says so, then okay, but he'll help us through it. But God doesn't destroy us. He doesn't randomly take us off and just destroy us. He doesn't do that. God protects us, beloved. We need to, we need to hear that today. We need to understand that God is, is looking out for us if we look to God as our source. And if we trust him, trusting him, very interesting. Let's go on to the scripture because this is 9 through 16. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place, your living place, because you've done that, no evil shall befall you. 
No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give you his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways in their hands. They shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot because he has set his love upon me. Therefore, I will deliver him because he set his love on me. I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He's known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will. That's what the Bible says. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him what? I will show him my salvation. Reads like the New Testament, doesn't it? This is absolutely stunning. Remember this. We must set our love, our passion on the Lord. God will guard and cover us as his own will and his, as his own because we are his children. Born again through Jesus Christ. Let me, let me just, born again. Now people say, you know, what are you so born again? Yes, I am. I'm born again. Very important that we know and understand. Beloved, <clears throat> when, we, when we come to know Christ, our spirit is born in God. Our spirit is new. It's refreshed. And then we begin to learn and we begin to grow. Now, isn't that something? Remember, when you can tell the difference between right and wrong, you know good and evil. You must make a decision at some point. And that decision is, I must know the Lord. Now, it becomes important to us to hear and to understand what God says. God says, invite me into your heart. Jesus Christ, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. I trust you. Lord, I trust you no matter what. Help me today. now to continue on with our study of the Bible, and right now we're in the book of Psalms. Now, when I read through the Psalms, I can't help but think of creation, which is why we've dedicated the last two weeks to the study of the stars. Well, if you recall, yesterday we discovered how gravity can explain the orbits of planets, and today we're continuing our study as we look at some of the other things gravity can explain in the cosmos. First described by Sir Isaac Newton in 1687 in his classic work Principia, gravity is one of four known fundamental forces of nature. Though the weakest, it is gravity that can explain things like orbits, spheres, the triggering of nuclear fusion, black holes, and singularities. Indeed, the reason why the planets, stars, and many of the moons are spherical in shape is due to gravity. Astrophysicist Dr. John Hartnett explains that because gravity is an attractive force between all particles of the universe, as Sir Isaac Newton explained, it does not have any preferred direction and therefore acts equally in all directions. The result of this is that in the absence of the other forces, gravity will gather particles equally in all directions and the net result will be a sphere. If an object is large enough, its gravity can overcome all other forces and pull it into the ideal shape. This is why smaller objects like asteroids, comets, and tinier moons are not necessarily spherical. They are just not large enough for gravity to pull them into a sphere. The other thing gravity does is hold stars together. Stars are actually giant balls of gas, and though gravity was once thought to also be responsible for a star's energy output, more recent research has pointed to nuclear fusion as the source. While it is probably not gravity that is driving the energy output, it is gravity which contains the nuclear reaction. In fact, the gravitational force in a star is so great that it manages to contain the explosive reaction and the energy is converted to heat. 
As a result of this continual nuclear reaction, the star becomes so hot that it radiates energy like a light bulb. Gravity can also explain black holes and singularities. But what are these strange phenomena? Physicists believe that when extremely large stars burn out, the gravitational force overtakes the star and it collapses, creating a violent explosion called a supernova. But what does the star collapse into? For stars with a mass 50 times or greater than that of our Sun, it is believed a black hole would form. A black hole has been described as the condition where gravity is so strong that even light rays cannot escape, and as a spherical region of space within which nothing can ever be seen by outside observers. Additionally, the edge at which light can reach before being sucked in is called the event horizon. But what happens to the collapsing matter once it has crossed the black hole's surface? Cosmologists admit that they do not know. One says, the idea that matter collapses to a point, technically called a singularity, remains rather obscure, and that singularities are weird. You know, this image that we see of gravity holding and containing things together reminds me of the Bible passage in Hebrews 1.3, which says that it is Christ Jesus who upholds the universe by the word of his power. And not only that, but it is by him, Colossians 1.16 says, that all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Truly, our God is amazing and powerful, and he's the lover of our souls. Corey, what did you study today? Today, I'm going to be taking a look at a true staple in the ancient Middle East. We're going to be looking at olive oil and olive oil production. Now, the Bible talks about olive oil a lot, not only in its symbolism, but also, uh, you know, when it's talking about the, the, the rules and the offerings for the temple sacrifices in Jerusalem. Really interesting study. Take a look. One of the most valuable resources of biblical Israel was the olive tree. From it came one of the most precious and diverse products of the ancient Near East, olive oil. In Israel, olive oil had sacred use in the temple for light and offerings and to anoint priests and kings. In everyday life, it was used in cooking as a main source of dietary fat. It had medical applications, was used in beauty products, perfume, soap, and was fuel for oil lamps. Two months of the year were dedicated to harvesting and processing olives, a culmination of the year's growing season. Within a couple of days after hand harvesting, whole olives would be crushed into an olive mush, either by hand using a stone roller, by using wooden shoes to stomp them, or a bit later on by using a large millstone in a circular basin that was pushed around by man or donkey. The crushed olive mush would then be scooped and packed into round baskets made of natural fibers and designed with a hole in their bottom to facilitate oil drainage. The baskets were placed onto pressing vats, large stone storage containers. Early technology utilized a large wooden beam with heavy stone weights that was leveraged against the stacked baskets of olives, pressing the oil out of them. The number of presses determined the quality of the olive oil and whether it was suitable for religious use, human consumption and medicinal purposes, or for cosmetics and fuel. Later on in time, new pressing technology was invented and began to appear on the scene in the 1st to 4th centuries AD, mainly the screw press that used screw technology rather than a beam to squeeze out the oil. Freshly pressed oil is not perfectly pure, however. It's mingled with water and other naturally occurring substances from the olives, so the oil must be rested and separated. This was often done in large jars with stopped up holes near the bottom. With resting, the oil would rise to the top and the water to the bottom. Unplugged, the holes drained out the wastewater first, and then the oil could be collected and stored. So there we have a study on one of the most precious commodities, one of the most precious products uh, in the ancient biblical world. And we see that reflected in the scriptures, don't we? With, with um, olive oil being given as a tithe of first fruit. So that 
first pressing, the most uh, pure pressing of olive oil going to the temple. You know, it produced less smoke. It it had uh, it had the best flavor. Not that it would have been tasted, but it was used for the sacrifices. It was used for uh, the lamps in in the temple and the tabernacle, and just that principle of giving the best of the land and the best of what you have to God first, and then using the rest. So. You know, olive oil in the Bible is is also symbolic with the Holy Spirit, and we mm-hmm. talked about that a little bit as little bit as well. And this is something that the Bible does really well, and that God does really well is using elements of the culture of the day when the Bible was being written to communicate truth to the people. So, I mean, while we still have olive oil today, and we still use it, you know, all over the world, back then it would have meant more because they were so much more familiar with the process and it was such an integral staple of life, especially when you consider that, you know, animal fat wasn't a huge uh, portion of the diet. So most of the fat content, because the human body needs fat to survive, came from olive oil as well. So this was a huge element, a big staple in the Mediterranean world and in the world of ancient Israel. So very cool. I think it's interesting Mm -hmm. that you you talk about um, this representing the Holy Spirit as Mm -hmm. well. And of course, in uh, the gospel or in the in John, it says, anyone who is sick, call on the elders of the church and let them anoint them with oil. And that had a practical meaning. I mean, because it was, yeah. oil was used to was. place on wounds and to put on your head. And mm-hmm. of course, the idea of the shepherd psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want and all of that. And then he anoints my head with oil. Yes. I think that again is a, an example of how they used it to heal. Well, and then also when you when you take a look at the image of the righteous person mm-hmm. it's throughout the Bible, uh, they're often called olive trees, mm-hmm. olive sprouts, uh, things of that nature. So again, it's just this central element that God is communicating spiritual truths using something that's so integral to a culture. So while we can absolutely understand that today from our own cultural perspective, once we realize how integral it was to yeah. the culture of the ancient Middle East, the, the culture of the Bible, it adds that extra element of understanding to the symbolism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. It, it, it becomes interesting to uh, study oil in the Bible too, and to look at olive oil and how it's used. Mm-hmm. Because as you do that, God is uh, revealing to us everything. And it's, it's absolutely amazing. So it's great. Uh, anyway, just and real briefly, just before we go on, I'd, I'd like to, do you have something you want to mention uh, about Galatians? Yes, Galatia? I do. Okay, so if you're getting tired of going through the Psalms, I understand. So mm-hmm. why not join us for a study in the New Testament? Take a little break and go into the New Testament. This is our uh, DVD offer for this month. It's a, a sermon series on the New Testament book of Galatians done by Pastor Rod, my dad, sitting right over there. Uh, there are six sermons on here uh, spread across three DVDs with some really fun bonus features of vintage quick study teachings on Galatians. So if you'd like to get a hold of yours, get a hold of us. And it's for a suggested donation of $60 to the ministry. Yeah, there's some things on there, the uh, old television programs, 2008 and the rest of it, which are interesting. Uh, of my dad and just really good stuff. So I didn't do it. I mean, it was put together by your... What's that? Uh, on, and all centered around Galatians. Galatians. Yes, as well. Topically yeah. organized. Yeah, this is the Galatians. first book that, that Paul wrote probably uh, in the New Testament. And uh, it's great, it's excellent. He's the confirmed writer of 13 books, I think 14, but 13 books and uh, we go from there. But anyway, it's a very good uh, uh, look at some of the older programs as well. And my dad as well, who I miss greatly. He was an excellent person Um, and wonderful dad, a wonderful dad. Taught me how to read the 23rd Psalm. That's the first thing I ever learned how to read. You know that before I went to learned how to read in kindergarten and all that stuff. That's what he taught me. He taught me that. Learn how to read this. The Lord is your shepherd. You shall not want. Anyway, it's great. Um, Question. Yes, we have a question. We have a question. (laughs) It's a fantastic question for Friday. Hmm. Based on Psalm 91, and I have given multiple choice. Um, Flip it over. Close your Bible. (laughs) No, no, we should open the Bible. I can read my Bibles. Mine's not on the right page. Read theirs. Wait, what? No, I'm I'm reading. I think he shouldn't have to answer the question. I think so too. No, no. I've got my I got my Bible. <laughs> I'm quite assured that he would be able to answer this without his Bible because we've heard this phrase several times in the program already during your teaching. And um, now I know you were not here we for were not. that, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. it's a little bit of a different story. But 
Well, you're going to have to try to restrain yourself from giving the answer. I have to. I get to restrain myself. You have to try to restrain yourself. All right, I'm going to restrain yourself. All right. Myself. So restraining. According to Psalm 91, God's truth will be your what? God's truth will be your help and strength. God's truth will be your peace and light. Or God's truth will be your shield and buckler. I what do you think it is? I think shield and buckler. I think so too. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Now there's a lot of people at home right now that are saying the same thing, I think. So. Oh, wait, I got, I got a vote from the control room. Oh, yes, yeah, okay. They, they, what'd you say, DJ, in the control room? You said shield? He says he, they think in the control room that it's your shield the and buckler. Shield and buckler. That's what they say All in right. the control room. I'm going to read the answer directly from the psalm. It's psalm 91, verse 4. He, meaning God, shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Mm. Very now, good, very good. I just need to say that in the ESV version and mm -hmm. some other versions, it says his faithfulness shall be your shield and buckler. But truth is in the New King James Version. That's a good Bible, by the way. It's an excellent Bible. But uh, anyway, it's, it's good. And that's verse 4? What's that? That's verse yeah, four. Yeah, that's verse four, yeah. Excellent. Uh, and uh, let me just say that uh, we use the New King James Version so people can understand it, but uh, I study with the ESV and the New King James and all of that. They're good Bibles, so just make sure that uh, you hear what God is saying. And uh, remember, the Holy Spirit is there to teach you as well. So, you know, you're not totally ignorant. You've got the Holy Spirit in your heart to help you learn the Bible.